All right, this is far more formal, uh, but this, of course, also lets me ask, ask whether anybody has read the paper. It's been there for two weeks. All right, that's about the same answer <laughs> as getting at a graduate class. <laughs> so, so I guess my inclination was right not to start from the end of it, but <laughs> at least include some of it. 30 minutes, 30 minutes, and, you know, what we did yesterday, before I yesterday, is everyone basically kept their remarks under 15, Okay, okay, I try, I try to do this. Um, now, um, actually, well, well, this is a paper that kept on going and going and going, and, and, and you really get the feeling of it. Uh, we haven't really approached the subject we actually want um, want to go to. Uh, thinking about thinking about this, it actually occurred to me last night that this paper is at least ten years late. Uh, it's at least ten years late because I was thinking back to a workshop we had in this very room, and that must have been more than ten years ago, on the new systems theories, um, new systems theories book, uh, when we were um, scanning various systems theories of uh, world politics, um, and I got in the Lumanian version uh, pretty much, and uh, Alex surprised everybody that out of nowhere popped up um, uh, the early versions, the very early versions. Uh, the very early versions of the um, um, of the quantum paper, and uh, at, at that time I had really the feeling, probably uh, uh, deservedly, that both did not really speak to each other, and and, and I think in a way that this paper uh, actually tries to accomplish many things, uh, and the first um, it does try to accomplish is uh, how and to which degree quantum uh, and systems theory uh, do and can speak to each other, and uh, then also to think what this means um, for IR. So let me. Uh, quickly and briefly run through a couple of, um, of issues um, on this, assuming that all or most people in the room, and I think this is a pretty fair assumption, know more about quantum than about systems theory. Um, both, both systems and quantum theory are, let's put it very uh, uh, simply, are theories about the world. Um, they are both similar in the sense that they do take a specific fixed, they do not take a specific entity as their starting point, and uh, the share between them what is uh, a radical departure from um, many aspects of a classical um, worldview. And I think actually the difficulty of thinking both together is that what I feel is uh, still a big problem is um, I mean, people look at quantum theory, but when they try to transplant it to the social world, they think about the social world in pretty classical social terms, social theory terms. Um, and they share, I think, two very important concepts uh, in both of them, and that is double contingency in the case of systems theory and uncertainty in the case of quantum theory. And what uh, these concepts share is that there are not simply characteristics or attributes of a world that is out there, but they are built into both bodies of theory as generative and reflexive concepts. So both concepts account for how social and physical realities emerge and make claims as to the possibility and the limitations of knowing and describing them. Um, the problem of double contingency, that is the equivalent of uncertainty in quantum theory, the problem of double contingency is um, simply um, uh, the question of um, how it is that meaning emerges um, under the condition that psychic systems psychic system consciousnesses uh, are black boxes for each other. They are not wired together. We might get to this point at some point uh, during technological evolution, but um, the brain and psychic systems are inaccessible for each other. They can only be relate to each other in the social world through meaning. And the question is, how does meaning emerge um, under this condition of double contingency? And how, to put it very simply, this is then the basic question for all social theory in this respect, how can it be that the myriad of possible communication offers um, under this condition of double contingency um, leads to the emergence of a kind of structured complexity in social systems rather than communicative entropy babbling, basically. Just explain what double Double contingency is that in the encounter of two psychic systems, um, they are not directly accessible to each other. So they need to rely on either some kind of pre-established meaning. Uh, there's always um, society that is presupposed in that kind of meeting, which does not 
which does not preclude, which does not preclude that there are first encounter situations, uh, but there are, as we all know, uh, pretty difficult ones. Um, you need to establish the very basics of communication in that respect. So it's epistemological. It's an epistemological distinction, not an ontological. Let me come to the. Because that sounds like what you're saying. When you answered his question, you said it was an. You made it sound like it was an epistemological distinction because you said they actually could have some sort of encounter, but they didn't know what it was. Well, encounters do take place. I mean. Okay. Okay. But the point is, because it sounds to me like what you're calling double contingency, and contingency is normally a metaphysical, ontological term. You're actually ascribing epistemologically at this point. At least at this point, in terms of the way you've responded to his question. Yeah. yeah. Okay? You yeah, understand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's uh, go on. <laughs> yes. Um, now, um, the continuation of society, uh, in that sense, as being something based on communication, that is the structured continuation of myriads of communication, is of course neither fixed or mechanical, nor is it completely arbitrary. Uh, it is channeled in processes of social evolution, and we can look at it in historical terms through the evolution of forms of social differentiation, the, um, the development of symbolically generalized means uh, of communi communication, and so on, um, and so on. Now, um, what we actually concentrate upon then uh, is that um, on the uh, background condition of these what we take basic similarities, there are even more similarities between quantum and systems theory regarding two basic concepts. Um, and particularly the concept of observation and the observer um, and the concept of meaning. Now, um, the observer in both cases is the culminating point of the relation between knowledge and reality. And while classically this relation is conceived as a problem of the well-foundedness of knowledge, um, conceiving of what is perceived as dependent on how it is perceived. And this is the case in both quantum systems theory. If what is perceived is dependent on how it is perceived, actually changes the basic problem of social theory. Um, it changes the problem of what exists and can be known an ontological and epistemological question, to the question of the distinctions that are used in observation. Now, turning to systems theory operative constructivism, what is crucial in this respect is the distinction between operation and observation, as it replaces the classical distinctions between subject and object, thought and being, as well as between transcendental and empirical. As an effect produced by the observer, a phenomenon is what appears in the observation, while an observation is an operation that cannot simultaneously be observed as a phenomenon. So everything that comes after the operation of observation is first of all generated by it. Um, the concept of the observer thus refers to formation of systems in which operations take place. A system forms when operations are not only single events, but concatenated sequences that can be distinguished from an environment. Each operation as an element of an autopoietic system reproduces the system. And therefore, the observation is an operation, and the observer, who is not a he or a she, it's the observer, it's it, um, who can be a he or she, but the observer is a system who observes the operations. So this observer theorem thus becomes self-referential and um, reflective. The operation observing um, is defined as the unity of distinction and indication. Without a distinction, nothing could be indicated. Um, this distinction needs to be asymmetric and only mark one side of the distinction even though the other, the unmarked side, is always presupposed and carried along. Uh, this is what uh, Spencer Brown um, calls a form in the logic um, uh, of, of forms. Now, phenomena and observation in this sense do not exist independently of one another 
but complement each other in forming a local reality. So we would argue um, that there are very clear analogies here um, that might be more uh, than mere analogies. For the time being, let's call them analogies. Um, both the radical constructivism in the sense of the operative constructivism of systems theory and quantum theory assume that the world is not objectively given, but determined by the unmarked space, as systems theory would have it, or superposition, as quantum theory uh, would have it, as the world's background of indeterminacy, in the forefront of which objects, things, appear. In analogy to quantum physics, uh, Luhmann developed a complementary notion of the observer. The observer itself stands for an operation, while the operation causes phenomena that the observer cannot see, being able to observe the effects of the observer's operation. <coughs> this, in turn, changes the local reality to which the observer belongs. Put bluntly, this is the uncertainty principle um, outside quantum physics. Operation and observation together, like spin and location, together represent a unitary description of reality, yet both can never be observed at the same time. So there are rather clear analogies, we would argue. And uh, um, just very briefly, I think uh, these analogies can be had um, in the context of the concept of meaning um, as well. I think there is an analogy between the concept of meaning as the difference between potentiality and actuality on the one side and the concept of wave decoherence and wave collapse on the other side. Both concepts refer to the observer dependency of social and physical reality and both concepts refer to the same theme that every observation is a demarcation out of which the world comes into being. Now, Taking these, taking these two things together, where, where do we go from here and what does this actually mean for IR, yeah, quite obviously. Um, that's the big elephant in the room on all these things because thus far what I've been saying is an exploration of two bodies of thought and theory that share among themselves being very radical deviations from classical worldviews, both natural sciences and uh, the social sciences. Uh, well, first of all, what I think um, is an implication of looking for these analogies is that there are quite a range of unexplored um, links between different bodies of theory out there that uh, um, might be worthwhile uh, looking into in a more systematic fashion. Uh, and that also uh, it might be rather worthwhile to dig a bit deeper, I'm not an expert in this, into uh, a range of intellectual traditions that might feed um, into both that thus far have been very little acknowledged. Um, my, my guess would always be that there is more in terms of intellectual forerunners to the quantum theory project in what um, Alex, uh, Alex actually has hinted at in out of a sudden turning to Leibniz. Um, uh, and uh, there is this continuation of Leibnizian thought in its reception, particularly by Deleuze, um, in, the, um, uh, in social um, theory that I think might be very worthwhile exploring because I think here, for example, you have this very central role of the difference between potentiality and actuality mm -hmm. that plays into this entire vocabulary of quantum um, and systems theories. Now, um, it is quite clear um, that if and when we all do this, it's not a matter uh, it's a matter of simply applying this to IR. Um, it's not, these are not concepts you throw at some kind of a pre-existing um, body of thought and a field of inquiry um, as what both quantum and systems theory actually share um, is uh, a quite radical unsettling of basic concepts. So uh, in a sense, in a sense it means for explorations of IR to start anew um, and my personal hunch would be, and this is where I hope to take this uh, further, but, but it also connects to some of my previous work, is um, that the implication of all this um, is to actually, um, f as a first step, um, 
ask yourself, I mean, what are the basic questions that emerge out of thinking through the social world in quantum systems theory terms that can usefully be um, asked um, in the academic realm um, of IR. Uh, we certainly are not in a position um, out of practical concerns and maybe principally to actually say, well, we'll start a specific IR research question now with looking at it through a systems or quantum theory methodology. I think we are in a position where we need to concern ourselves about is what are the, really the basic questions uh, that we need to think about. And um, this, first of all, is a relatively simple exercise. I mean, uh, it requires us to think about, again, um, what are the basic categories and units of perceiving the world um, that, I'm, uh, that I'm playing that I are all about. What does it mean to talk about any kind of systemness um, when we look at it through the concepts of quantum um, and systems theory? And it um, certainly also leads us to the realm of actually asking about what uh, and where IR actually sits uh, in the grander scheme of things. Um, if there is anything like a system of world politics or a system, an, uh, an international system, how can it be thought about um, in non-classical themes? So it's really not an issue of throwing these very complex theories um, at some existing body of knowledge as it undermines some of the very certainties on which that body of knowledge is built, uh, but revisiting some of the very basic questions. Now, I think this is something worthwhile exploring, but it is, and this is my own personal experience, hellishly difficult. It's hellishly difficult. It's hellishly difficult because um, in this particular case, in this particular case, we're looking at quantum theory as something that, I mean, everybody in this room has probably experienced as rather unsettling really unsettling. I mean, challenging very conventional notions uh, of knowledge and the way we have come to know the world. Um, uh, however, I mean, as, as, as it is, as it, is um, it happens to me time and again, one observation, I briefly hinted at it, uh, at it already, is that many people talk quantum and when they turn to the social world, um, uh, still operate with very established, entrenched, classical notions of persons, subjects that are out there that somehow we can redo. And uh, the hellish difficult challenge here, but I think also the promising thing, is that when I turn to systems theory, well, there is actually, there is actually a body of thought that is equally unsettling um, to social theory and the analysis of the social world because it doesn't rely on these categories. Persons play no role. Uh, consciousness plays a role in the environment of social systems as a psychic system. So it's a quite radical, radically different way of seeing the social world, but in the sense that they are both in the same way radically different, um, they leave us with barely any points of reference in our experience um, as academics of, of seeing, the, um, seeing the social world. And this is what makes this difficult, but, I mean, the, the, uh, the trough with, which we have here, I think, seeks to argue that it is a path worthwhile exploring, because the analogies, and for the time being, I'm saying no more, but the analogies are quite obvious. I think I'll leave it here. Yeah? Yes. Thank you. So you can take your own questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. First of all, um, sorry I, I didn't show up at the very beginning of your talk, but I want to ask a question that seems to be in the spirit of your talk and given what you've said, actually. Um, I'm just wondering whether, uh, so you refer to Luhmann as providing some kind of guidance in this matter, and it seems to me that the whole train of your discourse is kind of along those lines, at least that's how it seems to me. Um, and, and so I'm wondering um, whether the point of bringing in Luhmann is actually to establish a kind of meta-perspective in which you can stabilize the instability that the quantum realm tends to, uh, you know, instantiate. So, so, so 
So the point here is this distinction between op operations and observations mm. that you're talking about. It seemed to me that part of what you're trying to get at and what you think is important and, and what would be, as it were, the task of social theory is to get at this kind of meta level where you can actually see sort of what's going on in something like a double slit experiment or its analogy in social life. But you get it from a kind of stabilized God standpoint. Okay? That, that seems to me what you're going after. At least, at least the only way in which I can understand Luhmann as being useful to this project is in some sense trying to get to a meta level. Where, where in a sense, um, what's going on between the actual people who are doing the experiments in the double, the double, split, double slit experiments and coming up with these kind of quantum results, there should be some kind of higher level way of understanding it that kind of stabilizes it for everyone. And it seems to me this is kind of what Luhmann is going after. Is that not correct? No, I would beg to differ. Um, okay, okay, I'll, I'll, because that seems what to be... Because there is the value-added question about why we need Luhmann. And, and it would seem to me that would potentially be what Luhmann might add. But, but if you discard that, then I wonder why, why bother? Well, for the time being, for the, time being the, the, very simple, the very simple answer is that while, while quantum theory of... I'm not saying the application because this would be wrong, but bringing quantum theory <laughs> to the social world and to IR, um, in a sense, um, is, is still in the stages, in the first stages. Uh, I, I, would, I would argue that systems theory, although not in the discipline of IR, but, but generally, uh, systems theory view of the social world um, is in a more, well, it simply has a longer tradition. Uh, it's more differentiated and, uh, um, um, and developed. And um, so for the time being, for the time being, I, I would say that uh, given these, for me, rather obvious analogies between the two lines of yeah, thought, it might, it might, yeah, but, but still, it, it's worth exploring what comes of this is if, I explore, if I explore these and look for, let's call them mutual perturbations. I wouldn't say I'm at the stage where I say, oh, I take this meta perspective, which kind of well, sticks to... But from which standpoint are you operating from, right? I mean, it's an issue about your, your position, right? And, and I take it that the strength, whatever strength Luhmann has, is always as being meta to anything he's talking about. No, I would disagree. I mean, I, mean, I would have thought that that's kind of the strength of the position. Sounds like you guys need to have a conversation. Like <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, okay. But I think that's okay. Yes. Thank you, Matthias. This was very helpful. I've been defeated by Luan for a long time. We all have, but it's my fault, not Luan's fault. Hmm. And I was very grateful for you pointing to that system theory, which I wasn't ready for to absorb, but you guys did, which I recognize as a very important book. So very first question, are you a student of Newman's A student of? Yeah, I mean, have you worked with Newman's No, no, he, he don't. He's, he's been very influential for you. Right? Yes. Right. So, um, I was writing in a little handwritten note here, David sits next to me, he said he had the best six months of his life writing this review article for Alex's work, right? And I said, well, there's your book is now out, which I'm very eager to read, and I said, <laughs> another six months. Okay. Uh, but I am, you, you're saying, you're drawing back from the road. Remember an old saying from Morgenthau, you know? Here are all these, he was talking about method authors, not about method theorists. You know? Always sharpening the tools, never cutting anything. Mm -hmm. And I thought that the issue of psychology and consciousness is <coughs> one of these meeting points, ought to be the entry to the world for you. Hmm. Not saying, oh, in the philosophical vision of German thought, I got to rethink the world now. You've rethought the world. Now engage us. Why is that intuition wrong? I think the intuition is wrong for the very simple f fact that a probably it isn't needed if your goal is a theory of society and the social world. But it is needed if your 
you want to convince people that there's purchase to be had. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a risk that we stay at a certain level of theory, which will be very satisfying for you, mm -hmm. but which will cut you off from your audience. Mm -hmm. so you have to at least demonstrate to me, if not demonstrate, illustrate that there's purchase to be had. And I'm trying to find out why, is, why are you holding back from doing it since you've identified the thing which also motivates Alex's work. Wait, just, 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 but just to get this straight, I mean, we, your question is not about anything between systems theory and quantum theory. It's a value added question. Yeah. That's how I take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, not at this stage, but I mean. But isn't even when you add it, that's too much like a statistical version of it. It's simply saying, give me some red meat or give me some cucumbers. I feel vegetarian. <laughs> 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 mm. <laughs> something to chew on because the investment. The intellectual investment for me is very large. Yeah. yeah. Well, then, of course, in terms of self-advertisement, I do hope that you get around reading that, <laughs> read, uh, re reading that book because that is a conscious effort to actually do this. But this, of course, has nothing at all to do with quantum um, stuff. Yeah. Uh, give, give, me, give us one episode from the book Well, I mean, one of one, one of the main arguments is actually one of the main arguments of the book is that actually um, this kind of theory, which, and I could go into a long argument, the systems theory part. Um, systems theory is a shortcut. I mean, because there is a systems theory in there, uh, but there is equally important a theory of social differentiation in there, and there is equally important a theory of social um, evolution in there, and I think. Uh, what, what I can make rather, um, rather, uh, rather convincingly is, well, for me, uh, even for others, uh, but what I can make um, is the argument that there is a specificity to what I would call the system of world politics uh, that only emerges um, in, in the long 19th century, um, that we have something like the balance of power uh, being a symbolically generalized medium of communication. Um, that always the system it ser observes itself through that symbolically generalized medium of communication. There is no other way of there being a system of world politics if you do not use something like balance of power as this observational scheme, which actually gives you a lot of purpo uh, purchase um, in actually explaining uh, while on the one hand this appears to some people to be a naturalized, even <coughs> law-like thing, the balance of power, um, uh, and on the other hand, uh, why, it, um, uh, why it fails to go away. So this is one line of exploration, but I would say, huh? okay. That's great. Are you including Chinese international relations in their formulation as natural symbolic manifestation of something? So it would hold for the Chinese world too. Yeah. That is a big claim. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't follow who was first. So, uh. One way in which I think systems theory may be a bit archaic for what, <laughs> what I don't mean it in its total, but I mean mm -hmm. a place where I think there's a real tension, uh, is, is at the end of the book when, when Alex starts to engage people like Andy Clark and I would add Mal Forrest to that list, right, this sort of extended mind hypothesis, which for me is vastly more advanced than Luhmann's kind of reworking of the Kant other mind problem, right? So the problem of double contingency is the old phenomenological problem of not being able to know the other mind. But the whole point of the extended mm. mind hypothesis is actually that a tremendous amount of our minds are shared in the material world, right? Mm. And then it becomes like a collective binding problem rather than the internal neuroscience binding problem, where mm. how do you get this cohesive social world through all of these shared sort of external relations? Uh, and it seems like for Alex, quantum helps do that, right? So like where wave functions, right, all the way up and all the way down, it explains how we can have this sort of both contingent but bound system at the same time. Whereas it seems like Luman is basically, it's like, I don't know, Habermas with a thousand more Lego pieces, right? Where we, we just create these really intricate social systems, but we still fall back on this Kantian noumenal phenomenal problem. Uh, 
as far as consciousness comes, which just throws us back to all the same fights over consciousness that, that Alex is trying to work through. And so I'm not sure, like, where's the forward, it's not just where's the purchase, but like, how does systems theory get us any further on the mind matter problem, uh, rather than just building this kind of like Baroque, really cool coliseum where the mind matter problem plays out the same way it has since the 18th century? Well, I guess the trick is, the trick is, the trick is and this is what gets many people up up the trees, is that this theory would say, well, the mind-matter problem is of very little interest to us um, when it comes to talking about the social world. But that means it leaves matter out in a very important way. Hmm? Alex is bringing matter back in. That means you're leaving matter out in a very important way. Can, can you, when, when you, in your job, well, well, I'm, I'm leaving, well. Your, your distinction between operations and observation, can you go into that in a little more detail? Because that maybe gets at what you're trying to get at here. Well, the. Well, 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 wait a minute. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> that may be a different question. No, it's not so different. I mean, I just like, for me, this is just like the critique of pure reason, but we notice the world more. But, but right. he's trying to, he's really trying to use Luma as a leveraging device. I know, I just don't, I don't see where the fulcrum is. Uh, I understand. I understand your point. No, no, I take your point. Well, maybe. <laughs> you two guys. <laughs> maybe is a short way to put it. Like, I mean, consciousness is not unimportant. Uh, mind is not unimportant. Mind and matter are not unimportant. But the, I mean, but the the trick basically is to say, well, well, the social world, but how do you the so the, the the social the social world, is actually is is a world constituted by communication and by communication alone, and matter and mind and consciousness are the environment of the social systems. They are in the environment of social systems. Yeah. Well, of course it's counterintuitive. Quantum theory is as well, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but the fact is, the I understand, is really, does it really care about humans or individuals that much? It's a theory of the system. Yes. Well, yes, I mean, I mean don't, don't care. I mean, I mean, I mean, persons are persons. I mean, persons are not people. Persons are addresses. In, of communication, uh, and, and this, I mean, this is the, and um, maybe all the biologists around the room might know this, I mean, this is, this is, this is the uh, counterintuitive idea of autopoiesis, uh, that every element of a system is produced within the element, and that there is no way in and no way out in a kind of physical fashion. You can only observe the system, observes its environment, it observes uh, uh, Systems in its environment it might, might be able to observe a system environment um, uh, distinction, um, but there's no direct way in, uh, direct way in or or out. Now, to be, I mean, the, the one thing, I mean, how far you can get with this is a different question. I mean, it has, it has been done in biology. I mean, Luan takes a lot of his clues from the natural sciences, actually, from general systems theory there and what Maturana and Varela um, have done. But uh, the indeed very counterintuitive thing is that social systems are social systems are social systems based and con on and constituted by communication alone. And then psychic systems, psychic systems are the environment, in the environment of social systems. What they share with social systems, what they share with social systems is that arguably there are the only two kinds of system, and this is the big challenge by quantum theory. I mean, systems theory would always say, well, psychic and social systems are the only two kinds of systems that are around in contrast to natural systems uh, that are based on processing meaning. And this is, I think, one of the basic challenges in this respect also of quantum theory, uh, is that quantum theory now advances a position which actually says that meaning the category of meaning and the category of concepts, actually, um, has some purchase beyond what we traditionally call um, the world of psychic and, and, and social systems. I, I, I think... I think Let me make a brief comment on the question. Uh, the comment is, you're trying to draw analogies between systems theory mm. and its work. You have to be very specific on that because the analogies between systems theory and one specific formulation of quantum theory, which is the one that uses Copenhagen uh, mm. formulation using wave function, 
because if you don't do that, the other formulations, you can't make that analogy anymore. Uh, the, the question I have is, um, I find it within that formulation very hard to compare because one of the biggest challenges that quantum physicists face today is to come up with quantum cosmology. There's no theory, there's no quantum theory of cosmology. And if I understand well, systems theory is the equivalent of a cosmology. So the analogy that you're drawing, I think, is a little bit misplaced because we don't have a quantum cosmology that is consistent and accepted by physicists. There are a few attempts here and there, but there is no theory as such. And therefore, the analogy that you're making is maybe a little bit misplaced. And I have a test for that. The test is to use category theory, of course. And if you express systems theory in terms of category theory, and then express quantum mechanics in category theory, there are certain mechanisms that allow you to very rigorously and precisely make sure that you have or you don't have an analogy. Hmm. Okay, that was one back there. Shall, shall we not collect them? Um, well, I think I we should move on. I mean, um, but let's, okay, Gadori, you want, did you want to ask a question and just maybe? Just a humanistic question of clarification. Um, the idea of the psychic system as a black box that is that can be that can exist in the category <coughs> of communication and meaning almost seems to me to reproduce the classical idea of the person as this sort of inviolable bounded thing. Um, how are psychic systems not formed by social systems? Oh, they are absolutely formed, but psychic systems are also autopoietically mm -hmm. self closed self-referential systems. They observe social systems in their environment. They are formed, of course, but there is no, in a sense, they are not directly plugged into this. Monads of windows. But are they separable, <laughs> though? Are they totally separable from the other persons? Because if they're separable, then Dory's basically the point is the holes, and you've got an cl implicit classical picture here. Yeah. Whereas you well, they are, they, are, they, are, they are separable from the other systems. Yeah, it's a classical. Well, is it, are, they, are they separable from other psychics? Is your psychic system totally separable from my psychic system? Yes. yes. If it is, then we're in a classical relationship. Exactly. Um, but if we're entangled, then we're not separable. But it no, sounds like you're saying we're, we're separable. Separable, but, well, but linked in, linked not in a sense of a direct connection. I mean, that's the thing, but through operations of, obse okay, uh, right. operations of observation. Let, let me, just, just, oh, just a very brief. Jane does a two-finger actually. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's a possible escape hatch for you. Oh, I don't try to escape. <laughs> I don't try to escape. <laughs> based on a communication process that links the two analogies. Hmm. One would be with, um, with each decision, and this is the cosmology of many worlds, you collapse the wave function. Hmm. It's basically the cubist philosophy. If you see what I'm saying right now, the communication act creates the worlds. Hmm. So, I'm not sure. I don't know if that's a cubism, but it might be quite out of this. Just a very, very brief, I mean, the one thing I fully acknowledge, I mean, but this would have gone too far. I mean, this is the road into it. It's not, it, it's not the interstate built yet. I mean, if I build the interstate, of course, there have been many lanes that have to take very different versions of, so of, qua <laughs> of, of quantum theory and systems theory in account. I mean, I'm starting from very parochial, uh, I admit it, very parochial and very easy and mainstream readings of both bodies of theory. Otherwise, this would become mind-bogglingly difficult. Um, um, and yes, and yes, however, I think there is an issue. There is an issue about cosmology here. Uh, I haven't talked about it at all. I haven't given it much thought at all, but this is of course an entirely different question. I mean, both, I, I basically said both bodies of theory are about world views, which is, I take to be, it's about cosmology, and, and, um, and, uh, I, and I think what both actually share, and this is more, more than an analogy, is although both are about the emergence of structures of any kind, uh, structured reality of any kind, um, non-entropical, social, natural, whatever structures, both quantum and theory and both systems theory, um, 
uh, actually propose a cosmology in the end that sees the world as utterly messy. Yeah, that's actually a good way to end. <laughs> <laughs> utterly messy. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Leo is gonna, this is Leo Gennaro Orlando, this goes by Leo, um, and he was recommended, are you, well, I'm here at Sciences Po in political science, or IR, or? Uh, we do science and international relations, actually, in France is kind of the same. But I came to know Leo through Karen O'Brien, who's a geographer, um, and so who's interested in quantum stuff, so um, I was eager to reach out to say. You have a clicker here. If you not add up. The clicker is? If you. Yeah. So this will advance it, and for something you want to point. Great. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much to Alex for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. Apologies in advance uh, to the people who were at ISA and they are going to endure this uh, for a second time with uh, some minor changes, but the very same bad jokes. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to present today, it's, uh, it's kind of a Frankenstein between different things. Uh, on one hand, it's a little bit what I am doing in my dissertation that I'm supposed to finish this year, that is the environment. Um, then there is, well, quantum and all that. Um, but I'm going through a direction that it's uh, kind of new for me and it's not even really what I will intend to do uh, afterwards, just for a couple of things. So, well, I mean, there will be like five things here. The connections are very weak, so you will not have trouble steering it down. Um, okay, let's start. This is uh, about Gaia. I don't know how familiar you are with Gaia theory, the people that work on the environment, um, they certainly do, but uh, for others, maybe I will have to give you a little bit of an introduction. Um, so the Gaia theory was uh, created by James Lovelock, mainly. Um, James Lovelock is kind of a very strange uh, character. Actually, he uh, he's an outsider entirely. He has degrees in chemistry and in medicine, but he's mostly an inventor. He worked for NASA. And there uh, he was participating at the Jet Propulsion Lab in, in Pasadena, California, uh, for a Viking mission in order to explore if there is life on Mars or not. And um, what he said is that we don't really need to go to Mars to actually check if there is life or not. We can do this from here um, if we take a look into the atmosphere and for the conditions of life. Um, so what James Lovelock says is that the Earth is a self-regulating system that tends towards equilibrium, towards homeostasis. Um, this was very um, discussed, uh, in particular, by the people in the evolutionary field. So he redeveloped his theory with the help of Lynn Margulis, who is uh, an evolutionary biologist. Um, so what um, Lovelock says, Guy is the planetary life system that includes everything influenced by and influencing the, the biota. The Gaia system shares with all living organisms the capacity for homeostasis, the regulation of the physical and chemical environment at the level that is favorable for life. So um, what he's uh, saying sounds a lot, for those who are familiar with it, to Earth system science, right? the Amsterdam Declaration, that it's uh, a joint declaration, but several uh, scientists working on the environment, on uh, different things relating to, to biosystems, etc. He said the Earth system behaves as a single self-regulating system comprised of physical, chemical, biological, and human components. But Gaia is not entirely Earth system science, right? And the lecture of Gaia that is done by Bruno Latour, that is the author that I'm going to follow now, it's a it's little different from, from this. Actually, um, well, Bruno Latour, he has, uh, in this book published in 2017, Facing Gaia, that is a translation from the French, and the French is a translation from a series of conferences in English. Um, what he says is that the Earth behavior is inexplicable without the addition of the work accomplished by living organisms. From now on, the incessant action of organism succeeds in setting in motion air, water, soil, and proceeding from one thing to another, the entire climate. So what did this mean in English? It's um, 
What Loglo proposes is a geophysiological understanding of Earth. Uh, he thinks of the planet as a complex process of interacting organisms that not only adapt to their environment, but also that shapes it according to their agency. So, Latour jokes a little bit and, and says that this is kind of a cartoonish, sleepy, beauty, everything, animated uh, idea of, uh, of Guy of the planet, right? Um, so, the thing here, and if I can, it's that this is not exactly what, according to Latour, what Loblog is trying to say. Because for Loblog, according to Latour, Gaia precludes the idea of totality. It's not a unity. It's not one thing. And at the same time, it abandons the idea of parts. Right? So th this, is, this is very puzzling because the Earth is like this wall system, but at the same time, there is no totality, there, is, there are no parts. So the question here is, how to obtain connections among these agencies, right? If we have all these living organisms that interact in order to open their space and create the environment, how we have the connections among all these? Well, one of the critics that has been addressed to um, the Gaia theory is that it's a classical mechanical Newtonian system. And uh, that maybe it could be better explained from a quantum perspective. Of course, we can think about entanglement, right? So entanglement would be a good way, maybe, to uh, try to understand the, the Gaia theory. Um, but why go to uh, entanglement if, can, if we can go to a weirder way of, of quantum? Uh, and different interpretation, the fifth one in, in Alex's book, and that's the one of David Bohm, right? So. I'm going to explain a little bit. We all are we are all familiar with Bohm, but uh, just why I'm using him. Um, what Bohm does, as we know, is he turns the familiar mechanistic scheme upside down. And instead of saying that the universe is made of some basic elements, he postulates that the universe is movement, right? So this idea of movement, of flux. Um, and in Bohm's work, what is needed is to give up altogether the notion that the world is constituted of basic objects or building blocks, rather than wants to view the world in terms of universal flux of events and processes. So, of course, we can think of Whitehead in a wellness and the implicate order, Bohm's book. It's, of course, th there are some, he tries to set himself in comparison to, to Whitehead's um, ideas. So, everything is flux, right? This is what he calls the undivided wellness in flowing movement, or all the movement, but we're not getting there. So what does this mean, right? This definition that actually, in my mind, it kind of suits very well uh, Gaia or a quantum vision of, of Gaia. Um, one basic architectural proposal is that the totality of existence is enfolded within each region of space and time. Now it gets even weird. Um, so this idea of enfoldment, right? So then he came with the idea of the implicate order. Everything is enfolded into everything, right? So uh, of course, we have all read Alex's book, so we know that the model that um, he proposed, that David Bond proposed to explicate this, is the hologram, right? So. The hologram state that is there. This is actually Homer interacting with Matt Groening at the Comic Con. Uh, a hologram, right? So what's what's the thing here? What's the thing with the with the hologram? As we know, the difference between a picture is that well, it's a reproduction one to one. So if we cut it in half, we have half a picture. While the hologram, every unit enfolds the wall. So this is a little bit what Bohm is saying regarding the universe. I think that from here we, we can move to um, what is implied here and also what in my understanding of Alex Wood was uh, one of the, the core arguments, one of the consequences of what he's proposing and at the same time the pillar of what he's proposing. And I said this over dinner yesterday and he said that this was correct so I'm, I'm not sure for that interpretation. And uh, the thing here is panpsychism, right? So what Bohm's saying is that the implicator, and if everything is enfolding into everything, well, then this applies both to matter, living and non-living, and to consciousness. So um, 
this idea of panpsychism of mind uh, being everywhere it's um, if I, okay so this is like very appealing and very interesting for the Gaia theory but at the same time if we are going to try to understand that from a perspective of uh, international environmental politics or international relations the problem that arouse here is well how to make all this war from a sociological point of view um, and there is actually one sociology that's one of the other people that I'm introducing that uh, builds on panpsychism uh, and that is mentioned several times in, in Alit's book and that it's our friend Gabriel Tarf. So what Tart says is that everything is a society, right? And he really means this. It's like everything. When he says everything, it's all the interacting entities, both humans and non-humans, macroscopic and microscopic. All these for him, those are societies and every one of each is what he calls a monad, right? There is a, a difference between his monads and those of Leibniz, because for Leibniz, as we know, the monads are closed. Well, here for Tard, they are open, they have windows, right? Um, and he came to the conclusion from this that matter is mine, nothing else. So this is uh, what he understands of what's going on in reality. And for him, basing on that, well, he uh, established a series of uh, principles of um, of society, of sociology, how it should work. And society, according to him, it's all invention and imitation, right? What, what is going on in society, it's not processes of, uh, well, governability, it's just imitation that we have there. Um, imitation happens by action at a distance, and he actually says action at a distance, he used this expression. Um, why action at a distance? Well, because According to Tard, when we are imitating, he, he gives the example of a photographic plate, right? It's like, what I imita am imitating this, it's just I am copying, but, well, here the problem that arises, which kind of causality do we have? In a previous version of this presentation, 70, 72 hours ago, um, I stated, following certain uh, readings of Tard, that for him there is no causality, right? Jairus uh, accurately and kindly pointed out that this is not so clear. In any way, what one of the readers of the Gabriel Tal, Bruno Carcenti, says is that it's by no means a mechanistic classical causality, right? So the thing here, and this is one of the very, in my view, very most interesting uh, conclusions of Tard, is that all the processes that we see in society are in some way unconscious. Uh, and, and this is fascinating because currently uh, it's what neuro, uh, neuroscience, experimental psychology, they are showing that reasons came after actions, right? Um, so when I mention invention, right, for, for, for third inventions happen at the level of the brain cells. But the brain cells literally, like not only the individual, but cells within the individual. So, those inventions that happen within us are not entirely us. Um, so even the things that we think that we are consciously doing, for him, we are not sure about that. Um, so all this seems very, very nice, at least for people who are sold on quantum, uh, like me. But there are two questions, I, and I will close up with these two questions. Um, so we have all these connections between Gaia, Strubom, uh, to Gabriel Tard, and the glue of all this, of course, being uh, Alex. Um, I think is how we can undertake um, a quantum path of approaching the environment, approaching environmental politics, and I would say maybe even international relations, or how we can today approach uh, some kind of sociology that would follow uh, a quantum perspective, a Tardian perspective. Um, so, I don't really know. I have only one proposition, that if we take uh, panpsychism seriously, well, we need to do something with consciousness, right? And we don't really know where all this quantum thing would lead, but according to what we have today, maybe one methodological approach would be 
neurophenomenology, right? Um, so there are PhDs in neuroscience in, in the room that will be able to explain that uh, much better than myself. But the interesting thing about neurophenomenology that it's in, in some way neurophenomenology was developed by, uh, well, firstly by Charles Loughlin, that it's uh, a Canadian neuroanthropologist, but it was mainly developed by Francisco Varela, it was just mentioned by Matthias. And um, currently there are, uh, in France, Michel Vitbol, he's, he's trying to put that together with, with quantum theory. Um, it's this idea that actually we are not only taking a look at what's going on in the brain of the people that we analyze, but we are also asking them to reflect on what's going on. Um, on the preliminary remarks, uh, Professor Kanzelstein, he, he said this uh, introspection, right, that in his word there was all this introspection, and, and I found this word very compelling because he didn't say reflexivity, that is what we would say in maybe the social science or international relations. Introspection is a little bit this. Um, a neurophenomenology, of course, Varela, he was working with Buddhism. He had several joint projects with the Dalai Lama. So uh, in some way, it's a little bit what now in, well, what is in Buddhist sati or in the West, mindfulness. Um, but in my view, what is interesting also of this is that, well, we are, it's, some, it's not only an analysis of society, it's also an intervention. Right. So this is that we are kind of clearing this, this thing that was being mentioned before between the observation and what is being measured, right? So there, there is no separation there. Uh, so this is one proposal on the how. And to finish, the why, right? Why, why should we uh, go for a quantum paradigm? I mean, we have so many nice, fine uh, systems in the social science that allow us to do more or less our work. Well, my reply to that will be taking an example, right, a, a case, and that is Mars, right? So what's, what's going on with, with Mars? And this, uh, Charles mentioned, mentioned this, right? So we have on the left, right, this, this clear model of well, the sun, the earth, and Mars. No. And back in the time, there were people saying that this model was too elegant not be true, right? But the thing is that, of course, it was unthinkable. Um, I think, for example, when, I don't know, of course, we all know about Galileo, but think of Giordano Bruno, one of the first one uh, to claim for heliocentrism. When he goes to Oxford in 1583 and, and he tries to present this model, well, the rector uh, at the time said that actually, I'm quoting, it was his head that was turning around and his brains could not stand still. So, people, rather than accepting this simple model, prefer to go to some other ways to explain anomalies. And this that we have, what we have there, is the uh, geocentrical model. And well, this little loop that Mars is doing is, well, it, it was a fine mathematical model developed by Ptolemaeus in order to explain the reverse loop of Mars from uh, the perspective of Earth. So, my point here, and I will close with this, we can go for the easier model, even if it sounds crazy, or we can keep going to the sophisticated ways, no matter how fine they are. But in my view, going for this kind of uh, strange ways and try to make that work, it feels a little bit like trying to add, uh, to pour butter into a clock in order to, to make it work. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, this is interesting in a way, um, and, and but I was wondering, and, and I want to relate this a little bit to Arpi's talk yesterday with regard to relationality, <coughs> because um, whenever anyone in in the, the social sciences talks about agency, everybody lights up and thinks this is a good thing and all the rest of it, and I have no problem with that. But at the end of the day, you have to think about who the agents are how to specify the agents. Otherwise, it seems to me in the social sciences, there's no game, okay? And, and I take it that what TARD has in common with the relationality perspective that was being presented by RP yesterday is that in a sense, the agents are brought into being 
in a in, in some and, and, and this is because Tarn, generally speaking, had a kind of vitalist view of things, right? Right? Yeah. Right. So in other words, there were no preconceived notions of objects or agents or things, but rather they came into being over time, right? And and, and in a sense, this is why relate being relational was a kind of natural default position for his social science which made him very different from, let's say, Durkheim, who wanted to make some very clear distinctions, okay? Yeah. I think that's a very important thing, and I think it's worth also pointing out that those of you who think Tard is, you know, because Tard is very fashionable now because of Latour and Deleuze and all the rest of it, that Tard in his day was a French Spencerian, right? Laissez-faire, right? So in other words, life being developed in various ways, however way however which way it, you know, it develops, that's fine, we're not committed to anything a priori, right? I mean, that is kind of the view that Tard actually was part of uh, in, in his time. Nowadays, of course, we think about this a little bit differently, but, but I think it does, so, so ontologically, it feeds into a kind of relational perspective, but I think insofar as we're talking about social science, we're actually identifying agents is kind of important, for various reasons, accountability, the various normative things that we're concerned about, I don't think Tart's very helpful. Okay? Um, you, you know, in other words, one of, the, one of the tendencies of this vitalist move, that neo-vitalist move that we see now in social science, and, 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 le and I'm talking about this outside of the, the quantum issue, but it's something that I think the quantum people need to think about, is that you don't hold anyone responsible for anything. Right, because in a sense, all of the objects, all of the agents, as it were, come into being through the way in which the relations develop over time. This is the fundamental metaphysical standpoint from which this stuff happens. Right? Isn't that true? A little bit. It's. Uh, I mean, it's. It's like I, I am ready to to like renounce to every single thing that I have said, except for that, um, because I think yeah. Somehow it's, for sure, it's a relational, vitalist, sociology. Regarding biology, I think that he was very much up to the time. Um, what yeah, was being developed. Yes, but I think that he was also very critical. I think that he was just, uh, I, I think that today, that will be sold in one second for, for quantum, for evolutionary psychology, for and the thing. I, I don't know, I don't know, because he, I think he has a different understanding of, well, He's I mean, he, but he has, no, that for, no, okay. that for sure, likely, but he has written, um, well, there, there are several books trying to explain his psychological economy, um, so in, in regard to that, yes, I, I don't, I don't think that maybe he's Spencerian, but, yeah, it's like, we, we don't know, um, you know, you know, believe there was really no clear distinction between humans and animals, that's for sure, right, no, right. not only humans and animals, but, Everything out there. Exactly. Yes. No, no, no. And that's why you could start hooking him up with panpsychism. Yes, exactly. Yes, oh, okay. exactly. That, that, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yes. This is how the connections work. But I want to say something about this normative cut. I think equating agency with the necessity of a foundation for norms is something that actually Tarver against. So in the Critique of Penal Reason, which is this massive book on how we should hold people accountable, uh, he says that the problem with agency is that we think that there's something valuable morally in punishment. And so he tries well, to punishment's a different well, no, 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 hold on, no, hold on, no, hold, on hold on, let me finish. <laughs> he says that this notion of agency, right, which tries to hold people accountable based on responsibility rather than their effects. But that doesn't mean punishment. Stephen, if I can't finish it, I can't. Sorry, Sorry. Sorry. Right. Right. Yeah, so uh, his argument uh, is that the, the liberal notion of agency, which presumes that you're responsible for your actions, That's is okay. what produces... Hold on. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. Just don't the punishment. Uh, punishment isn't necessarily I are are all of them. All of them are all of them. Alex, Alex, can you please cheer the meeting? Sorry. I think this is vital to international relations. Uh, so his point is that when you start from a possessive understanding of agency rather than an effects based of agency, then you don't just pull people out of the system because they're they're killing people. You want to like do something horrible to them. So he makes this sort of Nietzschean move, uh, which then he picks back up in the general economy. So he's actually very critical of neoliberalism. His famous joke about economists is that economists are the only ones stupid enough to think that because numbers were already on money, that value had a quantitative assessment, right? So he tries to bring back the question of quality 
uh, and then a very pragmatic so they get to the okay, let's so, <laughs> but here's, here's the IR point. Okay. Uh, I think that the practical approach to thinking what systems or collectives do rather than what they are, right, which is to say to move from essence to form sure. totally changes how you'd understand the international system. You don't punish Iran uh, because Who's they talking got about punishing? Well, I, I am. Yeah, I know, uh, that's the problem. No, but, <laughs> hold on. But you think about the way that the system produces Iran as a, as a player that needs to think about using nuclear weapons because of the system they're in. So it depersonalizes right, the motivations behind agency and tries to look at the distributed nature agency which produces emergent phenomena, which gets us out of what I think is particularly true of IR, which is that we think about wars, sanctions, and almost all the things in the international system as forms of punishment because we want to hold people accountable for a certain kind of essence. You're fixated on uh, punishment. Okay, let's move on. We've got more questions. And somebody who has not yet spoken, so let's hold on, Badr Dean. But um, anybody else wants to sort of, uh, Michael? Yeah. So, so maybe one uh, minor comment. I, I think uh, the word homeostasis should be replaced by homeodynamics. Hmm. And uh, second, uh, what I want to say as a comment to you and you and the questions too, um, you guys should really look at your Zen Buddhism because it totally, it totally resonates. And for example, the question here about uh, accountability, uh, what, what answer is given in this context is you have to put the right attention. So you cannot act because you, uh, you don't want to be punished. You have to have the right view and to do the right thing, which if you extrapolate it on a societal level, leads to a stable society. But you have to put the work in yourself and not uh, act because you were taught. You, you really have to use your brain to do the right thing. But who is the and agent? Well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, so, actually, the Zen Buddhism, it's not just Zen Buddhism. Buddhism and quantum is a long-standing yeah. conversation there. It goes back many decades and stuff. Um, other other thoughts, because we're starting to slow down here in terms of our timetable. Um, oh. uh, get back to the quantum. Um, this is a suggestion for everyone here. I suggest that whenever you use a concept from quantum to define it for us the way you see it, whether it's entanglement or super, anything that you call quantum, because we are using quantum in different ways, just to be able to get something from this meeting first, conceptually, and also to be able to follow the discussion. So this is a general suggestion. Whenever you use any concept, please define it for us. Um, I have a suggestion for you. Uh, this came to my mind when I saw your title, looking class, and then you start talking about infolding and then the, the drawings. Have you, have you thought about using topology as a conceptual tool? Because it seems to be very useful in, uh, in helping you pin down what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to just to do think. Anybody else? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. if you need it. Okay, yeah, thanks. Perfect. Yep. Um. There we go. Um, yeah, so just for some uh, some context, uh, uh, this is uh, some of this is based on a talk that I gave uh, about a month ago for this group called Rebuilding Macroeconomics, and um, they were set up to sort of so-called revolutionize the field of economics, and uh, so I, I pulled out some quotes from a, uh, you, won't, you won't be able to read these probably, but um, from a uh, report that they did about a year ago. And they were kind of focusing on things like some of the basic ideas behind economics, like the way they focus on utility maximization, equilibrium, and so on. But at the same time, there was this growing sense that things like preferences are not fixed and known. They're actually constructed. They're context dependent. They're dynamic. They're collective. Um, also, the important importance of money and finance and things like uh, credit crises and uh, lack of interest in ethics. So, so I'm going to talk about uh, two different kinds of economics. 
Um, so the first conforms to our, our common sense, everyday understanding of how markets work. The, the second is I was highly counterintuitive. It's, it's almost magical in many ways, and I think it subverts all of our usual ideas. So um, I'll start with that one, the, the magical one, which is uh, neoclassical economics. I actually skipped this slide for the economics presentation. So, uh, so, so neoclassical economics. So if, if you ask, like, what is economics? From the you know, best-selling uh, American textbook, it says economics is the study of how society manages its scarce resources. Um, if you ask what is economics for, it says uh, something along the lines of utility maximizations. Uh, economics is about happiness, as uh, one book put it. How do we model the economy? Well, it's modeled as, a, as an equilibrium system. It's very kind of classical mechanistic sort of thing where you have individual agents who are rationally trying to optimize their utility. Uh, a lot of the results um, depend on pushing this rationality thing to a sort of its limits. People actually have a kind of a magical ability to, to see into the future and foresee future events. Uh, uh, prices are determined using these supply and demand curves. So these are, you know, they're taught in every textbook. You have a supply curve and a demand curve, and they intersect at a unique equilibrium point. And so you can use this formalism to develop all these uh, nice mathematical equations. Um, so I'm jumping around over here. How do we calculate risk? Well, the, the efficient market hypothesis treats price changes as random perturbations to, to an optimal steady state. And so it says that markets sort of make prices correct instantaneously. Uh, so, you know, if price for some stock or something gets out of line, then market forces like drive it down instantaneously to its uh, in, intrinsic value. Um, and because you can't predict all the sort of perturbations, you, you can't actually predict how the market's going to evolve, but you can predict the risk using statistics. And if you ask, what is the role of money in, in this economics, then uh, really in this picture, of, it's all just about barter and trade and equilibrium, and money actually doesn't really play any role. So the picture is of uh, trade boiling down to barter, as Paul Samuelson put it. And this is reflected in the fact that, as I'll, I'll show later, that money just doesn't sort of appear in the, in the typical models that are used. So, so just some questions about this sort of, you know, is, first of all, is economics the science of scarcity? I mean, this has been repeated sort of since the 1930s, but if you think about it, E economics, this whole picture of rational economic man and whatnot breaks down most under conditions of extreme scarcity, under, you know, when people are under pressure and poverty. Um, what is utility maximization? What is utility? What are we maximizing here? Uh, if you look at plots of happiness, they don't track economic growth. And in fact, uh, self-reported self happiness levels sort of peaked sometimes back in the 1960s or 70s, and we kind of plateaued since then. Um, why do we rely on these made-up constructs like a demand curve? I mean, what is a demand curve? I haven't actually seen a, a good example of a, a, a demand curve, and I don't think anyone else has either. And the problem is that supply and demand are not things that you can separate out empirically. <coughs> Prices reflect both of them, so you can't separate these two things out. And this is, this is actually a real problem, because these supply curves are what justify this whole equilibrium thing. Where is this equilibrium? If, if you're, from a complexity point of view, you would say that the economy is better viewed as being far from equilibrium in the sense that everything's being sort of churned around and you have these crises and so on. How do prices adjust instantaneously to reflect intrinsic value? What's intrinsic value? And this idea that prices react instantaneously, this is positively Aristotelian, right? This kind of magical ability. What, what kind of systems in nature, you know, apart from, you know, Aristotle's idea that things seek their own state and in a vacuum they would do so immediately. Uh, why did macroeconomic models and risk models fail during the crisis? That's a big one. And, and where is money in this picture? If, if you look at an economics textbook, it says that money is defined as uh, a medium of exchange. And in fact, most economists, as Mervyn King points out, don't really talk about money. Um, according to Richard Werner, the topic of bank credit creation, in particular, most money is produced in this way, has been a topic of uh, sort of a virtual taboo among central bankers. And this is kind of strange, right? I mean, you know, the economy is supposed to be about money, you would think. Uh, according to the European Central Bank noted after the crisis that um, one reason they didn't see the crisis coming was because the financial sector was absent. So this is a bit of an admission, right? The, uh, the, the, no the nominal value of all derivatives, all these sort of complex financial derivatives, was estimated over a quadrillion dollars in, in 2010. This is a truly magical number because it's actually bigger than the world economy. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to pitch a, a, a quantum approach, which I think uh, 
links with a lot of you know the things that, that uh, I've sort of heard over the last day or two. Uh, so it focuses on money and debt, how we interact with them. It argues that money is much more than an inert medium of exchange. It allows for context sensitivity, dynamic preferences, group effects. It's not based on these things like utility maximization and so on. It applies a role for ethics. I think it leads to a parsimonious modeling approach. It's actually kind of the ideas that kind of strip down economics. But like one thing about economics is it has a very ambitious research program, you know, kind of wants to colonize other areas, you know, and I sort of argue that actually, no, it should be kind of brought back. Um, and it starts with monetary transactions in this question, how much? So the, so the quantum revolution in physics, of course, it got started when physicists discovered that energy is transmitted in these discrete packets, which they call quanta. So in economics, the equivalent would be exchanges of money. So when you, you know, when you, you go to a store and you say how much, or quanto cost if you're in Italy. And I'll argue that the money system shows all these signature properties of quantum systems, such as discreteness and determinacy and so on. So I'm going to kind of draw, you know, like a, a, an analogy or whatever between the, the physics case and the economics case. This is a way of kind of making these points a bit clear. But so just as in, in physics, you know, to start with the most obvious thing uh, in physics, uh, things like energy are transmitted discreetly. And of course, it's the same with money. So when you, you go to a store and you tap your credit card, it doesn't kind of like drain out in a continuous flow, right? It just goes plonk in a single unit. And this is true also uh, at a macroeconomic level. When banks create money, they, they can technically do so instantaneously and discontinuously, as the, uh, the Bank of England pointed out. Um, in, in a quantum system, the position of something like a particle is fundamentally indeterminate and uh, sort of constructed by the measurement procedure. The same is true for an asset price. So, for example, if you're selling your house, you don't actually, you got this kind of fuzzy idea of what it's worth, but you don't, that only gets collapsed down to a single number when you actually sell it. And people who work in quantum finance, which I'll talk a bit about later, sort of, you know, develop this idea for stock prices and so on. Um, in quantum system, you have this duality, the wave, kind of duality between a virtual wave and a real particle, you know, in quotation marks, particle. Um, Bohr's principle of complementarity says that uh, this was reflected in theories of light, which kind of bounce back and forth between seeing light as a wave and seeing light as a, as a particle. Uh, money objects, too, are, are fundamentally dualistic in the sense that they have a virtual side and a real side. It's, a, it's something like a banknote or a bitcoin or whatever. It's, it's got a number, but it also has, it's an object, virtual or real, that can be transmitted and owned. Um, and these, these dual properties are reflected in the, the two main historical theories. So uh, the idea of bullionism of money is gold, chartalism, which says that uh, money is credit. And money itself has also sort of bounced back historically in emphasis between these two forms. Um, a property of quantum systems is they obey this kind of quantum logic that we, uh, we this sort of spelt and Michael talked about yesterday. So um, quantum properties such as position or momentum, as I mentioned, are constructed. They're affected by history, context, and interference. And, and the same, of course, is true in psychology. There's this idea that preferences are constructed. They're kind of made up as we go along. And quantum cognition treats preferences as these probabilistic quantum variables which collapse to definite values when measured. So in a, a sort of a simple economic example would be, let's say, like I have a, a, a loan, and I'm thinking about whether or not I want to pay or default. I'm sort of considering default. So one way to model that from the applied math point of view would just be to say there's a, uh, I'm sort of in a superposition of these two states and there's a certain probability of me collapsing down to, to one or the other. Um, interference effects in, uh, due, due to the sort of wave uh, nature of matter lead to or play a big role in quantum physics. So in economics, the, this tension between the two sides of money kind of creates interference effects in the human mind which have been explored. Uh, in, in areas such as quantum cognition and decision theory and so on. And the quantum formalism offers a very parsimonious way to model these behavioral effects. It's just kind of, a, uh, it turns out to be quite a natural framework for doing it. And as uh, Yukolov and Sornet point out, it's, it's really these interference terms that uh, kind of give the advantage to the quantum expressions. So entanglement, so in, in uh, physics particles can become entangled. So, for example, if you kind of classic cases, if you have two phot photons, which they can be produced in such a way that if one is measured spin up, the other way, the other one has to be measured spin down. And it's because they're they're part of a combined system. 
Um, so in a loan, uh, a decision to, if I decide to default on my loan, that immediately affects the state of the loan viewed as a separate system. So from that point on, the creditor, if he checks the status of the loan, he can only get one answer, which is that it's in default. Okay, so this obviously will take time for him to do, but it's the same when you do measurements on a photon, really. That, you know, measurements take time. And I think this is uh, just a very, you know, maybe one of the simplest versions, perhaps, of the, um, the kind of social entanglement, which is uh, studied in quantum social science. So you, you got to you sort of build up this picture that, um, comparing with the mainstream approach, like, you know, rational economic man is, is optimistic, and you kind of play around with behavioral stuff a little bit, tinker around the edges. But quantum economic person is sort of fundamental, fundamentally different. In its, it's, it's entangled, it's context dependent, indeterminate, dynamic, and so on. So what is this, this quantum economics? It's basically quantum social science plus quantum money. So the, the focus is on monetary transactions, this process of putting numbers on value. And I think, um, you know, he kind of, kind of joked about economists being the only person who sort of took this seriously. But there is something about putting numbers on objects and trading them, which, which turns out to do interesting things. Um, I think these quantum ideas are perfectly suited in particular to things like the creation of money, entanglement through loans and other contracts and credit default. These are particularly interesting because they were all at the heart of the, you know, the recent crisis 10 years ago, uh, but they were nowhere in the macroeconomic models. And of course, these are connected. You know, the reason we didn't see the crisis coming was because it wasn't in the models. So, uh, you know, I think what this perspective is doing uh, uh, for a start is bringing sort of attention to these things. Uh, and the point is not that the economy reduces to quantum physics or that quantum physics can be used as a fuzzy analogy. I know I've done that a little bit. But that the money system can be seen as a quantum system in its own right with its own versions of measurement and determines the entanglement and so on and should be treated as such. In other words, it's like the, it's the appropriate fr framework. Um, okay, so what would happen if we sort of accepted that and we modeled the economy as if it were the quantum system? And what, what would that actually mean in practice? Well, I think probably the first thing is that it puts money at the heart of the analysis. So especially things like the creation of money by private banks which was only even acknowledged by central banks like about you know, four or five years ago, and um, even though it's been going on forever. Uh, neoclassical economics sees debt as uh, neutral, no more than a redistribution, and, and debt crisis is caused by externalities, but these are really intrinsic to our credit-based money system. And modeling the economy without money and debt is like modeling the weather system without water, uh, which you know, doesn't get you very far, especially it means that it's hard to predict storms. So, in physics, Bohr's principle of correspondence states that at large enough scales, quantum mechanics should converge to classical. So you could argue that, okay, maybe, you know, at the level of individual transactions, you can talk, you use this quantum description for money and so on and so forth. Well, what does it actually matter? Because it's all going to, you know, wash out on the, on the bigger scale. However, I, I'd say the, you know, um, one thing is that in, in physics, you know, quantum properties do scale up by design in technology such as computer chips, lasers, superconductors, MRI, nuclear devices, and so on. Um, you know, if you think of something like a, a nuclear bomb, it's a, it's a very effective way of scaling up subatomic processes. Uh, money, too, is a, a designed technology. And, and economics is often presented as something that's going to happen to us naturally. And it's not. It's, it's carefully designed. You know, if you look at money, it's, it's got all sorts of things to kind of control it so you can't counterfeit it and so on. Uh, and its quantum properties scale up and affect the economy as a whole. Uh, for example, this money creation. So uh, banks make loans on real estate. This adds to the money supply. This is used to buy more real estate and so on. This is actually kind of like a breeder reactor for money. And this, the plot shows the uh, Canadian house prices versus the money supply. So you know, uh, all this analysis of house prices are based on things like supply and demand. That's not really the heart of it. It's just like there's more money being generated in the economy and going into real estate. Um, implications for modeling, so if, so if you, you know, accept this kind of quantum point of view, it, the conclusion is that the economy is nonlinear, it's entangled, it's fundamentally indeterminate. Prices do not reflect intrinsic value but are better interpreted as a, an emergent property of the money system. So this is obviously like a, a much less attractive place to operate, right? And uh, I think in physics, important point is that macro systems that emerge from micro quantum effects are not usually modeled during using the quantum formalism. I mean, we talked about 
it's true, you know, it's often said that quantum mechanics is, you know, the most successful, uh, you know, sort of physics theory because of this amazing predictive record. And this is true in laboratory experiments. But when you actually, like, it doesn't really scale up to, to other things. You don't really use quantum, you know, whether people don't, you know, look at the quantum physics of clouds or whatnot. Um, but it's the same in economics. So, uh, so, so basically, uh, probably the, the best approach is things like um, uh, network theory, complexity, nonlinear dynamics, all these tools. But I, there are also some things which do scale up, and I think one thing that might be useful is these quantum agent-based models which can be used to c capture group dynamics of decision-making under uncertainty. And you, you could apply these to things like uh, the housing markets, how people sort of shift expectations about housing prices or loan defaults and this kind of thing. On risk, just a, just a word, there's, so there's this whole sort of field of quantum finance, which uh, quite a few people work in, and it turns out that many of the formulas that are used by quants to value derivatives such as options can be restated in quantum terms. So things like the Black-Scholes equation can be just used for valuing options, can be expressed as a version of the Schrodinger wave equation if you want. Um, uh, Monte Carlo methods are used a lot, and these were initially developed for the nuclear program. So it's just a point that I think if one is skeptical, you know, rightly skeptical, that quantum ideas can be applied to economics, I'd say that actually some of it's already kind of happened through the back door. You know, kind of the, all the acceptable parts were taken out. Uh, and um, so I, uh, that, that sort of brings us to the question of ethics, um, uh, mechanistic approach. That, just sort of by seeing everything as a machine, you know, that just kind of everything happens to you, right? It, it, it downplays ethics uh, in its nature. And, in particular, it ignores the entanglement of the economics profession with the financial sector, which played a big role in the crisis as well, as it turned out. Um, and I think the, the quantum approach does acknowledge that financial decisions always have an ethical component, as do theories. So do we need a revolution in, in economics, as, as they were asking in the UK? I'd say not, not exactly. I think we need a recognition, because in the end, the, the revolution already happened a century ago, right? Um, and, and we're still sort of work, slowly working out the consequences from this. And as Marshall McLuhan said, I do not think that philosophers in general have yet come to terms with this idea that the days of the universe's mechanism are over. So finally, uh, to sort of sum up, um, I think that economics is a, per, a perfect application for uh, quantum social science for, for a number of reasons. One is that mainstream economics is based on this firmly classical paradigm, as I think they did not. Uh, ten years after the crisis, the problems of this approach have become you know, increasingly sort of obvious and acknowledged by a lot of people. But changes have so far been mostly cosmetic, sort of like a, you know, do, doing this thing of adding epicycles you know, around to, uh, to kind of make it look a bit more realistic. Um, uh, the purpose, the whole idea of money is to put numbers on the fuzzy concept of value. Uh, this has, I think this is kind of at the heart of what's going on. and, and lends it some of these quantum properties. And, and treating the, uh, the economy as a quantum system offers a natural and pragmatic framework for modeling all these effects such as money creation, financial entanglement, mass defaults, cognitive factors, and so on, all of which mainstream models struggle to address. I'd argue, I, I think there is true that we could sort of back off and say that, well, we're not, we don't actually have to use quantum and relate it to quantum stuff. But I think, I think it's worth doing because for one, for one, because the correspondence really does work out closely in some ways, and I think there's more sort of chance, you know, sort of interplay between the two. Um, but this area will probably have even more resistance to quantum ideas than other areas of the social sciences, in part because the stakes are so high, the, the, the financial sector is involved, for one thing. So impetus for change will have to come from uh, outside the discipline. And um, one, one problem, obviously, is that it's, it's situated in kind of the, sort of the nexus of all these things, you know, the, these sort of difficult topics or whatnot. So, so one of them is the idea that physicists don't really like it when you talk about quantum ideas outside their, uh, you know, their, their context, right? Um, Murray Gellman, for example, had this devoted entire chapter of his book to quantum mechanics and flapdoodle. So I, I don't actually know what flapdoodle is, but I don't think it's good. <laughs> uh, e economists don't don't like it when you when you talk about money. Uh, that's a sort of a tricky subject. Uh, as Alex has pointed out, uh, social scientists don't really like it when you talk about subjectivity and consciousness. And you know, I think he's right to like kind of persevere with this connection with the quantum. And I think it's, I think it's true with money as well. So this this area is is, is very kind of awkward place to be, but it's also potentially uh, very productive. You know, and just just to end with this quote from. 
uh, Keynes, he, this is from 1926, so this was like right in the heyday of the quantum revolution in, in physics, and he said that, and he was writing about a neoclassical economist, and he said the, um, the atomic hypothesis, which has worked so splendidly in physics, breaks down in psychics. We are faced at every turn with the problems of organic unity, of discreteness, of discontinu discontinuity. So he'd, he'd met Einstein. The title of his book was uh, probably inspired by Einstein's general theory. And so it's just interesting to ask how economics might have developed differently if it sort of followed that thread uh, inspired by quantum insights rather than classical approaches. Thank you. That's not the, the, the rationale I've learned. They have this correspondence. It can mean a lot of different things, some which are justifiable, some which are perhaps less justifiable. What I'm interested in, 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 in is you know, your, your, your focus of opposition here, which is, from my perspective, I'm not an economist, I'm a, political, I'm a historical political economist. It's a narrow set of models that strike me as being hopelessly outdated, even within much of the field of economics itself. And um, I wonder what would happen to your own thinking about this if you um, engage with some of the more historical work, let's say uh, inspired by Douglas North. For example, there's an enormous literature on, on the emergence of sovereign monetary systems and, and conflicts between central banks and local banks. It's really interesting in the American case, for example, where states wanted to be able to issue their own currency and there's a big fight with, with uh, the national government. And, and, and so it's, it's not as if economists, I think here Steve Hayward, Stanford, for example, they've written about this extensively. The other is the question of the relationship between financial markets and the, the housing crisis. Again, we have an exceptionally large literature that looks at those interrelationships. It, it doesn't seem to me to be invoking the magical thinking that you described to some neoclassical models, but it's also not quantum. I, I just feel that if you were able to show that that more specific, particularistic, I don't know what term to use, local set of models, were deficient, that that might be more useful. It almost sounds like you're still beating up on Milton Friedman. And you know, nobody wants to do that anymore. So that's all. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I'd, I'd say it's it's not old actually. I mean, this 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 has been going on. You know, the sort of heterodox economics versus, you know, um, orthodox. It sort of, sort of sounds like religious or something, but um, uh, battle has been going on for a long time. You know, so so critics of these mainstream ideas have. have being around, you know, like rational economic man was, was being criticized for the moment that was kind of bloated and, and everything. So, so this is really, uh, so, so what I'm talking about is the dominant strain of mainstream economics. But, but why is it important? It's because this is the one that influences policymakers the most. So if, if you look at, um, for example, the, the main models which are used to predict how, um, how the economy functions, these dynamic stochastic equilibrium models are, are, are sort of firmly in this approach. So these are the models which I'm criticizing, which kind of totally omitted the financial sector. Now, there's lots of critics who were saying, but money should be in there, you know, but this should be. But the whole point is they were all disparate. They were all kind of like, um, they didn't really have any kind of a unifying thread somehow. So you had different schools of thoughts, you know, from the Marxists to the Greens to the feminists and, and so on. We're pointing out the, the flaws with this, and so it's been going on for forever. So, so my my reason for for focusing on this school is that they're the most influential in 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 government, but also they've they, they put up like a massive smoke screen in the financial sector. So, all of this stuff like about markets being seen as as efficient and uh, assigning things that correct intrinsic value and so on and so forth. That's been terribly influential and you know that that's the sort of thing that you're kind of calling into question here so um, yeah so so certainly also there's been a big switch after the crisis so you know in the, in the last kind of 10 years ago kind of heterodox ideas are kind of starting to bubble up but if you look at um, you know the latest they, they had a kind of a couple of commissions or whatever kind of look into it and and they're 
conclusions are, I didn't, I didn't include them, but they're, they're always along the lines of, yes, well, we should, you know, do out of a bit more behavioral stuff and we should have a bit more of this and that, but there's no need to rethink, actually, the, the kind of the core ideas here. And I think the quantum uh, idea, so for example, something like behavioral economics is sort of says, it doesn't really question the idea that we're, the aim of the economy is to rationalize utility. It's more like, it's, it's trying to do that, but it's kind of got these frictions. There's always this idea of frictions, kind of like little adjustments. Which <coughs> I think the, the quantum point of view is different because it says that it doesn't even make sense, the question. You can't really, I can't rationalize my utility as, a, as an individual uh, so easily because I'm affected by everything else that's going, going on. So it kind of goes a bit more to the, the core of these things. Or I don't know who was next. Then directly follow, follow on this. What, why is it that despite the knowledge about the existence of, I mean, innumerable alternative or better about skills, people come to referring to a kind of mainstream, some might call it, straw man, but some orthodoxy, not a distance from such well. well, Why is this the case here? Why is this the case in, in, in IR? I mean, in the sense, I mean, um, I mean uh, the work of Wall Street that uh, now for long given the number of criticisms about it, so we become referring to it. I mean, this is not the case. This is not the case because orthodox economics or structural realism would be those of any kind of truth. It is not partly might be because of dynamics of knowledge and institutions of power in academia around that. Uh, but, but I would profess that it is the case because um, things like structural realism in IR economics in the other case uh, actually resonate um, quite well with some of the let's call it social features of how the economic and the political systems operate. And they operate uh, and I'm using this term again the term of economics uh, sense is being made, meaning is created on the basis of the symbolically generalized medium of communication of monetary value. It's not just the medium for exchange, the monetary value is, in, in the Personian sense, is a form of generous medium of communication, for making economic sense at all. And, uh, and, and orthodox approaches uh, are built very closely to that, uh, and this is why there's fairly little room around it. And I think the, the, the important thing is, uh, the important thing is uh, to acknowledge this. This is a sociological knowledge. Uh, explanation, but then I'll say, well, I mean, but from there follows very little. This is why I like actually the, the introduction on, uh, on why, where you say, well, I mean, this orthodox model is counterintuitive. I mean, this is actually, I think, when it comes to quantum theory, uh, what we should be starting when going to IR, uh, to have a huge presentation of what is counterintuitive in IR um, among these things. I think the, the, the straw man thing is kind of interesting because. I had a couple of quotes from Lionel Robbins, and, and he was saying, you know, that this whole idea of a rational economic man, it, it was, he didn't call it a straw man, he called it some, a universal bogey or something like that, which I think I hadn't invented the straw man idea. But, um, but it was funny because he was saying that in 1932, and the, the, the rational economic man only truly came into its own about 30 years later with. Uh, uh, arrow de Bro model, where they sort of said they, they pushed it to its absolute maximum and said that you know if man was not just rational but could also sort of see into the future and blah blah, then you could prove that uh, you know capitalism and so on was the uh, the best way to assign prices, um, and so so it's it, it's like uh, it, it's more kind of a debating tactic you know where these things you, you kind of they, they put forward a model and, and you attack it and say no that's a straw man you know that it's much more complicated. But if you actually, okay, then you go and look at the models. So, so I'd say like the main models for modeling the economy are these, like I said, these dyna dynamic stochastic equilibrium, whatever. Um, and they're based on, you know, supply and demand curves like that, which give you an <coughs> equilibrium. Equilibrium is in the name of the models, the they're, they're equilibrium. The idea is to sort of ration, rational, you know, uh, optimize utility for everybody. They make all of these assumptions. And there was no financial sector, and they kind of started trying to add in the financial sector, sector but as a kind of a, you know, um, a friction. So, so these assumptions are not, these are the core of the models. 
uh, if you look at the risk models which are used in quantitative finance, um, things like uh, Black Shoals, um, but all of the more complex things which are used to, to value all of these financial derivatives, they are explicitly based, you know, on, on the efficient market hypothesis and the ability that, that markets can be used to reveal. Like if you look at the collateralized debt obligations, which which all blew up spectacularly, they, they were being valued using something called the Gaussian copula method, which used the Gaussian, you know, bell curve to sort of, you know, assign probabilities to something uh, based on very, very classical assumptions. So these are these are not, you know, if, if this is a straw man, it, it like, you know, blew up the entire economy, right? So. Can I come in on that? Uh, I think it's really important to remember, though, that it's not really, I mean, the models are a problem, but they're not the only problem. The problem is the way they treat the models, and they treat them instrumentally. So the econ e you know, economists don't think that rational economic man actually is rational. They don't think humans are rational. <coughs> the model is not meant to be a realistic account. So that it's the philosophy and the underlying the construction of the model that's so the real problem. They're being instrumental about it rather than being realistic. Yeah. 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 yeah, I was just coming on the importance of the store sizes. and. Um, you know, Marx, we differentiate between exchange value and use value. He's saying something very similar to what you were saying. Um, Georges Simel, who wrote Philosophy of Money. And I'm not saying this to say that Marx was, you know, quantum of all on that but It's more like what Alex was saying, that what classical models are doing is forcing a simulacrum onto reality. Um, that there is a quantum, now I'm going to sound like a realist or a naturalist, but I think that that's your, your leverage there is to say there's an underlying reality here. The classical model is the counterintuitive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think that um, your insistence on putting debt in the forefront of economic analysis is important for one reason because there's no way that you can rationally make investments. This was Keynes' main point to come back with Pella uh, and I had Shea and Myers who more recently. And so all the models that neoclassical economics uses are for, for consumers. And they can't be applied to investment. And that's yeah. why putting money in debt at the forefront is so important. Mm -hmm. And I believe I'm going to just collect a bunch of comments because we're running low. Uh, my question is just about the relationship, the, the technical modeling side. So the relationship between what you're doing and maybe what Stuart Kaufman's project is, the more recent macro stuff you've done, like you're familiar with it. But the question would just be, what's the value added of you adding a quantum approach to to what complexity theory does with the macroeconomic? And I wonder specifically if, if the parametrization problem is easier in quantum math than it is in complexity math. When I talk to people about using complexity theory to model recursive systems or to do agent-based modeling or something, the complaint I always get from math people is, well, the model just falls apart basically as soon as you try to set it up. And actually defining an outcome, getting something interesting out of the model, is entirely dependent on what parameters you set up with. And so it's almost a moot exercise in terms of modeling. So it wouldn't have any authority or legitimacy in the economic world because it's all baked into the assumptions anyway. Yeah. So I wonder if quantum helps you alleviate those problems or whether it's just as difficult to model if you have to tweak it just as much to get it to say something meaningful. I think that the thing about the predictions being baked into the assumptions is, is a very good one, and it's true of uh, most models that are actually used, and uh, I'd say that the predictions baked into the quantum models are, are somewhat better than those baked <laughs> into the... <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's a good point, all these models... Uh, I think something uh, models apply to particular systems, like let's say like debt default, something like that, I can imagine that the um, uh, quantum, sort of a toy model probably could be could be very effective, but I haven't actually, as far as I know, it hasn't been tried yet, so... <laughs> Time for one last comment. Steve is waiting, so go ahead. Okay, so me? Okay. Um, first of all, I really love this talk, actually. <laughs> Let me just say, but, but um, picking up on James's point, it seems to me I'm willing to grant that the that, that, uh, sort of general quantum viewpoint can explain the economy better than neoclassical economics. So I grant that. But here's the issue. Even within quantum mechanics, there are constants. Right? And, 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 and I'm wondering whether you think there's any value in an idea that's been proposed, I mean, you know, fairly 
often in the history of, uh, of, of economics, and, and most recently by the economic journalist uh, George Gilder uh, in this book called The Scandal of Money, about, in a way, trying to peg the value of money to physical constants. So in other words, the prop so in other words, yes, you're right that the economy is quantum, but that's a problem and we should try to make it maybe a little more classical. Right. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and this is kind of what Gilder is kind of going at here in a way, right? right? That it's too quantum, the right. idea of the, of the economy being too quantum, and that there's not really a clear constant, so we can't actually do anything very you know, scientifically significant with the economy. It's all just too much guesswork, even much more so than physics. Mm -hmm. Right? This is kind of the idea. And I'm wondering, because I take it you're a mathematician? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Do you have any thoughts about that? Um, just a just in, in short answer, I guess, would be that, um, yeah, probably. That, that sounds interesting because, but I, I think a, an easier thing to do uh, is to simply to draw attention to the stuff. Because the weird thing is, is like when, when you look at, um, in the role of money creation in the economy. Like I say, it was only admitted by central banks a few years ago. I mean, it was all a big, big matter of debate and kind of, you know, no one was really owning up to it. It, it only became, it, the Bank of England kind of came out and, just, and, and said, yeah, this is what's done. So just kind of getting on top of that whole process and, and figuring out what's going on, that we can, you know, develop ways to kind of, because like I say, it's a little bit like a kind of a nuclear reaction. So it's, mm -hmm. like, it's like a chain reaction and you yeah. can either control it or you can just let it blow up, right? Yeah. So, okay. you know, something like that could, could be a, yeah, useful. Yeah. Peter, one I taught in a business school for a year, you know, you talk rings so true, right? <laughs> uh, including on the, with the GDP, right? Uh -huh. uh, but I had a question and uh, the question is that, you know, my pension is invested in index funds. Mm -hmm. And I've done really well. So does everybody else. And it's based That's on the wrong theory. <laughs> <laughs> so how am I... So it's, it's based on what? On the wrong theory. theory. It's a risk based on the efficient market hypothesis. I'm, you know, David Easty is a colleague of mine uh, who has been on your train for 15 years with decision theory. Yeah. Is, we can make it practically applicable. This stuff translated in the 1970s like a it was like like a pound of sugar. And unless we can get the practical application from the other thing, we will not dislodge the ball. It's based on an efficient market hypothesis if you conflate predictability with efficiency. Yes, but, they but, are, they but that's, that's, a, that's a, con, you know, a conflation because... Uh, Peter's the, agreeing with me. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Sorry. They're doing everything wrong, yeah. and I'm making money. Yeah, yeah. So can you not make, make, make more money with a quantum? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the reason index funds work is because they, basically you have a market, and everyone's you know paying. And index funds kind of take the average of the market, but they save on commission fees. So basically, you're going to outbe you're going to be so on maybe, average everybody. Maybe, maybe that's a solution, but I'm saying there is wrong theories can convince a lot of people, right? Right. If they work, I mean, the performativity of this was enormously important. You know, since I'm interested in more without complaining about cutting trees, right? But that's that's part of the. What kind of soil do we need? That's, I think that's part of the, the big reason neoclassical economics has been so successful is this vicariously managed to take credit for all this stuff. Because, like, if you ask what is the most famous. Uh, the you know, sort of prediction or whatever in the social sciences. It is the, I'm told that it's uh, Bond is saying that, uh, you know, the efficient market hypothesis yes. and that we cannot, which is, which is sort of like a ridiculous thing when you think about it, because it's, it's you know, it's seriously, it's the most predictable, you know, the fact that something is unpredictable doesn't really, you know, the fact that my, you know, transport, transport system is unpredictable doesn't give me some insight and allow me to say that it's, you know, extremely, uh, sort of perfect processing of information, which is what, what the efficient market hypothesis is saying. So, so it's this kind of well positioned to kind of take credit for a lot of these things. So I wonder more about the system where you know, weather forecasts have become much, much better, but the predictability of individual cloud formation, you know, uh, public health, we are, we are able to now individualize treatments, but we don't know where the next pandemic is coming from. I mean, sometimes our ignorance is up here in the macro system. Sometimes it's in the microsystem, right? Yeah. The applicability of knowledge 
of models that work or don't work, yeah. for me is a very deep problem. And it is also for quantum economics. I peer to this other model which makes me money, but which is wrong. I, I think the, the main thing is that the the neoclassical model really failed during the crisis because not only did it not predict it, it didn't see it. Like even after it happened, they still weren't seeing it. And, and so the quantum approach could help just by drawing attention to those things. And, you know. so I'm saying there's a quantum index fund, right? Quantum, quantum index, index fund, yeah. Okay, I'll yeah, I'm, 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 selling, <laughs> I'm selling shares in it. So. Right. Actually, George Soros had a quantum fund, so you can invest in it. Yes, so yes. let's take a 15 minute break um, and then we'll reconvene. And We'll have two papers and then we'll be back on time.